I'm so pleased to be speaking with you on a very relevant topic of managing well-being in the workplace. Um, as an employee experience and culture leader, my discussions often start with a focus on attraction, retention and engagement of um, key talent um, and how to uh, really retain um, the people in the workplace given the current environment. Um, but inevitably our focus turns to how well-being is actually hampering retention and engagement and what can be done to reduce the risk of burnout. Um, our Global Talent Trends study, which consists of 14,000 voices across 13 countries, has a really clear sentiment of that this year, um, as compared to other years, employees are feeling quite fatigued. Um, just to throw a statistic in there early, 78% um, of Australians are saying they're at risk of burnout, which is a huge increase from 63% in our pre-pandemic days. Um, and you know, from your perspective as a leader of uh, work workforce uh, mental health and well-being, what shifts have you seen uh, during the pandemic and the post-pandemic days with your clients? Thanks for having me, May. Um, I think for us, some of the things that I'm seeing predominantly around this energy crisis. I think one of our our, col our colleagues, Cynthia Cottrell, she talks about this beautifully as a global energy crisis. Um, and she talks about our needing to find these sustainable and renewable sources of energy for our people um, in workplaces and looking at ways in which we can create that job satisfaction and that sense of connection to work, the work that we do, which actually helps us to feel good um, because there are so many great health benefits of work. Um, but that, you know, when we continue to ask more of our people in an environment, especially over the last few years with the pandemic, where people are already, already low on energy in their everyday lives because they're having to respond to constant changes and constant um, shifts in expectations and lockdowns and all the fun things that we've had to navigate, when those energy levels are already low, we don't have not enough left in the tank to then come to work and also be immensely productive and immensely efficient and all of these extra things. Um, so I think it is really important that when we look at, you know, burnout as a concept, this um, some new emerging concepts that we had over the pandemic around things like languishing, right, which mm -hmm. is a little bit different to burnout. Burnout is that complete sense of overwhelm, that complete sense of you know, um, exhaustion language is kind of that, everyone was calling it the meh feeling, you know, I'm not, I'm not, you know, on in a crisis situation, but I'm also not at my best either. Um, and we saw some other really unique concepts emerge too. Um, there was a lonely, that was a new one for us as well. It's kind of the opposite of the loneliness effect that was really predominant with the pandemic, especially in our older Australian and younger Australian groups. Um, but a lonely was what most of us, you know, um, was feeling when we were working from home, essentially, too. A lonely is that lacking of personal space, right? Those moments in the morning when we drive to work and we can crank up our own tunes and listen to what we want to listen to on the radio after the kids have all gone to school. <laughs> we have our own space. So during the pandemic, we really missed out on those transition spaces. So we saw a lot of these kind of terms come through and really, um, you know, they were really epitomized in our everyday life. So um, burnout's been around, probably that concept's been around for a few years now, but it was never so prominent as it was during the pandemic period. And mm. so we need to, as you know, in terms of organizations, start to look at, um, I guess, strategies to combat that sense of having an empty tank. Um, by encouraging employees to find their joy and also find their flow a little bit more at work um, so they can have those moments where they're topping up that tank again. Mm. Uh, you're so right. That was definitely a, a clear 
trend uh, that we found in our research that the relatable and leading organisations are turning very much towards that human-centred approach when it comes to leading and learning from the crisis in terms of becoming more empathetic and how they reach out and connect with people. Mm. Not all the organisations are continuing on on that path. Uh, Some are potentially reverting back or thinking, well, pandemic is over now. Um, Now we're moving into a new phase. Um, The concern is that the top reason that employees are feeling burnout is not being sufficiently rewarded. Mm -hmm. And this is something that keeps cropping up in a conversation when I have with my clients that potentially leaders are not fully understanding uh, the definition of burnout and the sources in which um, you know, burnout occurs. And so they're thinking it's to do with the individual not being able to cope with their work or poor time management. But as you know, uh, the World Health Organization uh, officially um, categorized it as an occupational phenomenon mm. and not a medical condition. So really okay. is the onus is on the leaders to actually, um, you know, put the strategies in place. Um, From your perspective, what would you say are some of the more effective uh, workplace strategies and what are those critical um, success factors when it comes to uh, a wellbeing strategy that works? Mm. So one thing I always revert back to, um, I love to talk about this concept of a wellbeing bucket. Um, So we work with a lot of different clients who, you know, come from, you know, all different sized organizations, all different types of resourcing availability as well. Um, You know, some organizations are huge and they have unlimited resources and can bring a lot to this space. Others are working with, you know, maybe one person in the business who's really committed to this space and not a great budget for it too. So what I love to talk about though is, you know, we think sometimes when we think well-being, it, we look at things like, well, like let's do fun stuff like fruit bowls and yoga programs and maybe a meditation program and all of these things because they, you know, they help employees feel good, right? They bring this sense of joy, this sense of connection to the workplace. And those, all of those things are amazing. Don't get me wrong. I'm not discounting those as a well-being solution. Um, but quite often I have to encourage clients to kind of pull their lens back a little bit on the fun stuff. Um, and if I, I sort of expand on that well-being bucket, uh, I guess, analogy, if we think of well-being for our people as a bucket, right, and we have resources and we have all these beautiful programs and things that we want to give, and we think about us pouring those into the top of the bucket. Now that's great and the bucket fills up and people feel good, but there's also a hole at the bottom of that bucket. And that hole, unfortunately, is our employee's sense of health and safety to begin with. Um, And if we we don't look at strategies to plug that hole first, we can pull whatever we like in the top. It will just continue to drain out of the bottom. Um, And we won't see that value on investment. We won't see that return on investment from the the money that we are committing to that space or the programs that we are putting in that space. Because what we're doing is we're creating a situation where employees can't actually tap into those benefits because they're not feeling safe at work. Um, If I give you a really specific example, say, for example, we want to do a well-being seminar series, right? Talking about all the things that, you know, can enhance our sense of well-being at work. Unfortunately, though, in the six months prior to us launching that series, we've had a huge rate of employee turnover. Mm. So we have people on deck at the moment who are wearing three or four different hats because we can't backfill those missing people. And so they're, they're, they're run ragged, right? There's not a lot of energy in the tank. They've got a huge to-do list. And they see this email come through about this amazing well-being seminar series. They really want to go to it, but they have no time, number one, because they have these huge to-do lists. And they have no, they're not, they're not learning ready, right? They have no headspace for learning new concepts. Now, instead of investing in that well-being seminar series, if we actually invested in strategies that created this sense of psychological safety around those individuals who are spread so thin, 
looking at their workload, looking at ways that they can control and rebalance and redistribute that workload, um, looking at some new innovative ideas around bringing in extra help temporarily, um, you know, creating that sense of breathing space for that person, then it means that they can actually engage in programs like that because they have that that breathing space, they have that head space to jump on board with them. And you will then start to see more return on investment with those more fun aspects of the wellbeing piece. Um, but unless we address those kind of psychological safety aspects first, it, you, you, it is flushing good money and good, good um, ideas basically down the toilet because people will not, utilize, they won't show up for it. Um, so we need to make sure that we are balancing the fun, exciting stuff with the really practical providing people, you know, that opportunity to really utilise the fun stuff too. I can really relate to that. The, the wellbeing bucket and um, sort of putting in place these fabulous um, solutions and opportunities, but not uh, effectively addressing um, the barriers to actually being able to take on the positive change is something mm. we we also delve into in how we work with culture. Um, so I really like the wellbeing bucket analogy. And, and given that there's over a third of organizations who actually have committed and can see the prioritization around wellbeing and, and mental health strategies for their workplace, do you have maybe some more specific um, guidance you might give for, say, an organisation just starting out to think about mm. how do we best tackle this very large topic as opposed to perhaps an organisation who needs to review and re refresh what they might be doing? Yeah, actually, the solution that I would have for that is really similar for both scenarios. So. We are the Australian ambassadors for a, a product that we, we are launching this year called the Hero Wellbeing Scorecard. Um, now that scorecard was established uh, in our US Mercer offices, which is fantastic. Um, and now we're extrapolating that to um, in an international audience. So Australia is, is one of the first countries to jump on board with this. And in a sense, it, essentially this scorecard gives organizations, um, I guess, a bit of a benchmarking tool to work out what they have, where they're at, how they compare to other organizations in their industry and also in their geographical region. We can look at um, resourcing in that space as well. So it's not just actually, um, you know, the programs and initiatives that you have on deck or lack thereof. But it's also looking at some of the challenges to getting well-being going in an organization too. you know, executive commitment and engagement. We look at resourcing. We look at your communication plans. We look at the current program and how that's integrated into the wider organizational footprint as well, because we know that integrated programs are much more successful if they are tied to things like organizational vision, mission and values. So we look at that integration piece for you. And then we make some recommendations. So we'll work with organizations to build out, you know, a 12 month strategy, a three year or a five year strategy. Um, we look at leveraging off the strengths of that organization. So what you already have in play, and then we will make some recommendations around opportunities for improvement and where to next. Um, and it's not, you know, the scorecard is a, a, a 200 point system. But the idea is not to get 200 out of 200, right, on that system. The idea is to work out what exactly will shift the dial for that particular organisation. You know, you might want to just go from point A to point B, or you might want to go from point A to platinum standard, you know, world advancing kind of wellbeing initiatives, and that's great too. We can work with every, you know, every point on that spectrum to get some nudging of movement in that space and get some of that value and investment happening for you. I would imagine a scorecard system would work very well for the leaders who are very um, keen on measuring uh, return Absolutely. on investment or return on the individual perhaps um, in this current climate and, and knowing that um, their financial investment or change when it comes to implementing strategies actually has a clear return. Mm. Um, are you seeing that um, when it comes to a whole of organisation, 
Um, I know that in, in the work that I've been doing with employee value propositions and um, employee experience, um, there's more of a focus around a segmented, targeted approach when it comes to unique drivers and motivations across different personas, for example. Mm, yeah. And with over 35% uh, of HR professionals agreeing that a more targeted, segmented approach to their well-being strategies and their packages is the way forward for them. Are you now seeing a more a greater appetite when it comes to also segmenting um, how you approach well-being? Yeah, I think that the challenge that organisations have is that you know they want to meet their workforce where they're at, right? And because as individuals, we're all so uniquely different, we need we have unique needs as well. Um, and I think, you know, the pandemic has taught us this too, in that, you know, even our individual experience of the pandemic was so unique, right? And what we needed throughout that period was really different to the person sitting next to you. Um, and the challenge is, right, to meet the needs of many, but at the same time, we want to be inclusive to all. Mm -hmm. And that can be really, that can be a really tough juggle, right, at, at times. And I think, this is where data analytics can really play strongly um, to, you know, an organization's planning strat in the strategy piece. Um, looking at your data, so things like your claims experience, looking at grievances, looking at even things like exit interviews and why are people leaving? What are their reasons for leaving? What, what weren't we meeting for this person potentially? Um, looking at things like absenteeism, um, what, you know, what are the rates like? Where are your hotspots? Um, we've recently worked with a client, which was fantastic. It was such an interesting piece. We looked at workers' comp claims data and we looked at salary continuance claims data. And we were able to sort of notice some really specific trends happening around particular groups within the organisation. So, for example, um, one of the highlights was women over 50s in executive level or senior leader level positions um, were, had an increase in breast cancer claims mm -hmm. specifically. So the organisation was able to be responsive to that and realise that their current wellbeing offering was actually missing that group of people and that particular um, claims experience. And so in response to that, you know, one of the biggest, I think, issues with that senior leader level is time, having time to go and, you know, do screening and they put these preventative measures in place. Um, so they were able to create a program where they were bringing some of these early intervention um, processes into the workplace and fit that in with, you know, senior leaders days so that they didn't have to take time off work to go and get a breast screen. They could actually do that. Um, within the workplace and sort of start to put some of those mechanisms in play and create that really specialist program within their overarching wellbeing program to address real need that they were seeing in their claims data. Um, so being able to kind of pair back that data can be really beneficial sometimes. Um, they also had, uh, there were, another one was, you know, men aged 30 to 40 um, and an increase in mental health claims, which was really interesting to see, especially over the last three years. Um, and so then creating some of the uh, peer support men's mental health group um, and having more men trained up in the organisation um, to be those kind of peer or colleague support people so putting people through mental health response training or mental health first aid training so that men had more men to talk to about these things and they were starting to break down the stigma around men's mental health and really do a concerted effort to address that particular that particular group um, so that there was more on offer for that for that group and uh, yeah it, it was we saw some really great shifts um, we're still tracking and monitoring that um, with some surveillance around the claims data. But yeah, it was really interesting to be able to come in and do some really niche programs. The data insights and marrying those up together do often tell a, quite a, um, a unique story specific to that organisation. Mm -hmm. I wonder if uh, the uh, hybrid environment we're currently in now, has that challenged how you work with organisations to really uh, deliver on the health outcomes? I think it's improved our versatility um, in that space. Uh, I, I know, you know, 
the focus predominantly pre-pandemic was very boots on the ground. We want to, you know, we want to run face-to-face -face training or we want to have people, you know, show up to work. Um, and because we now have this ability to be a little bit more agile with the Zoom space, um, we can have colleagues dial in from anywhere in the world um, to a session and share their experiences and share their cultural differences, their geographical like or even regional differences. And it's been really wonderful in that sense of creating connection, which sounds bizarre because we're not in a room together. <laughs> But because um, the resourcing is, you know, and overheads are lower in a Zoom space, it means that we can actually run programs further, right? We can run more sessions of a program because we don't have to fly people in from all over the place to one place. And there's no, all of the overheads associated with that. But then we also have these opportunities to share amongst groups that wouldn't ordinarily get to share with each other and connect with each other too. So I think for us, it's actually created this really agile, versatile state of play where we can, again, and I hate saying this because it sounds so cliche, but we can meet people where they're at, right? In the comfort of their, of their lounge room or their, their home office, which is really great. Um, one of the other ways we've been able to be agile in this space too, is we have really forged into the micro learning space over the last 12 months. Um, so rather than doing these big four hour or whole day training sessions, what we've started doing is just providing these little brain friendly brain dumps of information that, you know, five, 10 minutes long, people can listen to them, you know, in a break while they're getting a coffee, while they're driving up to see their next client. Um, you know, going for a walk, they pop them, pop it in as a, a podcast in their ears, and they get this brain friendly dump of information that they can, that's practical and that they can apply it straight away in their everyday working life. Um, so that's been really um, intensified over the last 12 months. And we're seeing great responses to that because it's, I don't have time to read a seven page document. I don't have time to sit through a four hour training session, but I do have time to listen to a five minute you know, audio on how to habit stack or how to be more time efficient in my day or, you know, whatever it might be. So, yeah, I think it's opened up a world of opportunity for us. Meeting people where they're at. I love that. I'm going to use that now. So thank <laughs> you for uh, lending that to me. Um, I love those also, those mini brain brain downloads. Or... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, does that give rise to a... a a different way of working for for well-being strategies and this is my last question so it's more around you know leaving people with the sense of um if you're looking for something different and i know organizations are constantly striving to differentiate themselves from their competitors but also just to re-energize you know their own workforces what are some of the more innovative uh well-being and mental health strategies that you've been involved with Mm. Oh, geez, there's so many. Um, I, I mean, for me, it's really the tailoring, I think. It's not doing those one size fits all or tick a box approaches. It's being really strategic and looking at the needs within the organisation and then driving initiatives that meet those, tips, those individual needs. Um, I think that, you know, I... I in, in terms of the micro learning piece, I think that has been a really critical shift in our space. Um, you know, time investment and resource investment into arduous amounts of training. And, and you and I both know, May, when we, when we learn something new, it's about a 20% retention rate, right? So if we're sitting in um, a, a, a boardroom for eight hours listening to me drone on about mental health or well-being, you're going to retain 20% of that. But if I can get you in a moment where you are learning ready and I can brain dump in some really quick practical strategies that you can implement straight away, um, that's going to be way more effective um, than you, you know, listening to me drone on. Um, the concept for this actually came from another leader within our business. Um, it, was, it was a brilliant idea. What she did was rather than send out organization-wide updates in a huge email that no one read, um, she started recording 10-minute videos. Um, and, you know, we are in this society where these things 
are never too far away from our hand, right? We're primed for that kind of interaction and that kind of um, appetite for, for taking in information. So if we can shift even just our regular operational information downloads to something that's really, that our brains are already primed to accept, then that stands to reason that we're actually going to have a much better retention rate for the information that we receive, right? We learn it and then we do it. Um, so I think for me, that's probably been one of the standout things that I've seen. Um, I think, you know, leadership is a huge space and opportunity for us to inject some knowledge. It, I was just, I presented at the Psychosocial Risk Conference earlier this week and a big topic was how do we help leaders because there's never been a time in human history where leaders have had so much expectation in terms of what they do. It's not enough just to be a technical expert in their space or in their field anymore. They now almost need to have a degree in psychology to deal with some of the leadership pressures and team pressures that they're seeing in an environment where we're constantly asking more of our people. Um, and I think leadership capability building, not just around technical and soft skill, right? Traditionally, you know, we have moved into this space where we now want to encourage soft skill, but we also need to tie that into things like progression and performance. Um, we need to tie that into encouraging leaders from the minute their boots hit the ground, not, when, not necessarily when they come into the business with the title of leader, but the minute someone hits the ground in an organisation, they need to be encouraged and treated as though one day they will be one. Um, which is a real shift in mindset, I think, in some organisations that, you know, we kind of treat our frontline people as mushrooms until they need to step up, step up into a leadership position. And then it's like, we're going to expose you to all of this behind the curtains information. Um, I think the shift, we, the shift we need to make is actually people need to understand that from the minute they get into the organisation so that they can conduct themselves as leaders, because we all have this ability to influence the environment that we're in. Um, we have such an impact. And I think sometimes we underestimate the impact that we have on the people around us. So if we're encouraging that leadership mentality from the minute people get there, we're giving that, that the technical expertise, you know, in terms of professional development, we're building the soft skill set, but then we're also giving them and helping them to understand how they interact, how to have courageous conversations, how to set boundaries, how not to, step on people's personal values, those kinds of extra pieces. When they step up into the leadership role, they're ready to go. It's not such a huge skill gap that we need to meet to get them leader ready because they've already been on that journey and they're ready to go from the get-go. You're absolutely uh, speaking my language there, leading <laughs> self, leading others, leading environment, uh, something I desperately personally believe in. Um, and certainly, I'm sure, would make a fabulous next podcast uh, <laughs> and topic for our discussions. Thank you so much for your time, Ella. I've really enjoyed uh, having this discussion with you. Awesome. Thanks so much for having me, May. I've, I've really enjoyed it.